Pamela Becker, as was already mentioned, thank you very much. I'm a senior product manager on the Amazon Bracket team, and I'm very excited to talk about how to get the most out of today's quantum devices with Amazon Bracket. Now, of course, I'll introduce what Amazon Bracket is first before talking about anything else in case you're not familiar. But after that, I'd like to walk through sort of what we have learned from customers in the space over the past couple of years. Customers that are looking to explore and experiment with quantum hardware, starting with who are those customers in that space today? How are they looking to access those devices? And I'll also dive deeper into something called pulse level control. Uh, and I'll explain why that can be a powerful tool for customers to get lower level access to the quantum hardware. So with that, Let's talk about Bracket. Amazon Bracket is an AWS service. In fact, it is the quantum computing service on AWS. And we designed Bracket to make it easy for researchers and developers to explore and experiment with quantum hardware. With Bracket, you can use our open source Python SDK to build quantum algorithms, test and iterate on them using a variety of different simulators, as well as run them when you're ready on an actual quantum computer. Of course, as an AWS service, it is fully integrated with all the different AWS tools you might need to monitor and review and analyze your results as well. I'll dive into a little more detail about all these different pieces in a little bit, but before we do that, let's talk about who are actually the, custom, the customers that we see in this space today. Bracket was launched almost exactly three years ago, and over that time, we've worked with a whole spectrum of different customers, ranging from what we call pragmatists, all the way on the left-hand side of the spectrum, over enablers, all the way down to what we call pioneers. Pragmatists are typically enterprise customers like Volkswagen or Fidelity, who are looking to explore the potential of quantum computing and understand what that might mean for their business in the long term. These customers often work with enablers and partner with them who can help them understand the concrete use cases in quantum computing for them, as well as help their workforce get ready for quantum. A good example for this are global system integrators like Deloitte, for instance. We also work with many quantum solution providers, and uh, that includes our very gracious host this week, you see where, who build solutions on top of AWS as a platform, in this case, Bracket, for their customers. And this is a particularly interesting type of customer because they sort of blur the line between what we call enablers and what we call pioneers. And if you think about it, it kind of makes sense. If you're building a commercially viable solution that you're looking to sell in this industry with the hardware that is available today, you need quite a bit of expertise when it comes to quantum computing on one hand, as well as building quantum applications. And so that is what sort of brings them closer to the right-hand side of the spectrum to our pioneers. So pioneers are academic researchers and corporate scientists who are truly pushing the state of the art when it comes to novel quantum computing applications or better understanding the quantum hardware that we work with. And what you'll hopefully see over the next couple of slides is how Bracket can help meet the needs of these customers no matter where they are along the spectrum. So with that, I'd actually like to ask a question to the room just to understand who we have here. Any quantum solution providers? Raise your hand. <laughs> okay, how about enterprise customers? Any enterprises? Okay, we got a couple as well. Thank you for joining. Now, raise your hand if you have a functioning quantum computer sitting in your living room. Okay, I'd like to talk to you afterwards, but for everybody else, that was a trick question. But it does bring us to our first, perhaps, obvious insight, which is customers need easy access to different types of quantum hardware in order to be able to experiment with it. And Bracket can do exactly that. Bracket offers one-stop shop access to currently four different types of quantum computers. We offer a trapped ion quantum computer by IonQ, uh, where the qubits are basically implemented as electronic states of charged atoms called ions that are then suspended and confined in space using electromagnetic fields. We also offer two different kinds of superconducting machines, one machine by Rigetti and another one by Oxford Quantum Circuits, or OQC, uh, which are based on superconducting electric circuits that are typically built at very cold or cryogenic temperatures. We also offer a photonic quantum computer, so this is based on quantum light sources that emit squeezed light pulses, where the qubit equivalents are typically either the position or the momentum. And we have the Borealis device by Xanadu available on Bracket currently. 
And last but certainly not least, we just added a neutral atom-based quantum computer. So this is also based on trapped atoms. However, they're not charged, they're neutral, and they're confined using laser beams. And we just onboarded Quera's Aquila machine, which is a Rydberg atom-based device that is particularly well-suited to analog Hamiltonian simulation, or AHS. If you'd like to learn more about that, I encourage you to attend our fireside chat tomorrow with Quera, uh, which should be super exciting. But what is really neat about this is that you can use one single platform, one single form of access to experiment with all these different kinds of quantum computers and quantum devices. And you'll see that in action in a second. Now, this session is primarily focused on quantum devices, so I'll keep this brief, but I do want to acknowledge that quantum hardware is still a very scarce resource. So it was important for us to make it easy for customers to test and iterate on their algorithms before they actually have to run them on quantum hardware. So that is why we also offer a range of different simulators, um, both local as well as on-demand simulators. So how do you access quantum devices on Bracket? There are a couple of different options. As I mentioned earlier, we publish a open source Python SDK, which you can run locally within your development environment. But you can also use managed Jupyter notebooks, which has the advantage that you don't have to manage any of the infrastructure. It just runs in cloud, spins up, spins down as you need to. We also have a dedicated service console as part of the AWS console, where you can easily manage all of your service resources in one place. And you actually see that in a second as well. Again, it is a standard AWS service. Of course, we use all of the standard AWS services and tools for things like monitoring and storage and security. This is particularly compelling for enterprise customers as they often already run infrastructure on AWS and are used to interacting with these services and tools. So it's super easy for them to expand their portfolio to add Bracket as well. So let's take a look at a typical Bracket workflow. Any Bracket workflow can be broken down into three steps. One, select the device. Two, define your circuit. And three, execute your circuit and review your results. So as you can see here, within Bracket, we identify individual devices using the Amazon resource name or ARN. So all you need to do to target a different device is just change that one line of code. In this case, I did choose to specify a specific S3 bucket, so where I want to store my results, but you don't have to do that. We'll choose a default one for you if you don't. And in this example, we're choosing a pretty basic sort of bell circuit, which is kind of the quantum version of Hello World, if you will. And we're going to execute it using this concept of tasks and shots. A task is an atomic request to a device, and a shot is a single circuit execution and measurement. So in this example, we're running this task on the device uh, using 1,000 shots. So we're going to get about 1,000, not about, hopefully exactly, 1,000 results back and measurements. So typically, you would start in the AWS console, and you'd sort of navigate to our service dashboard. Uh, but I'll actually go ahead and skip exactly or directly to our example that we just saw, where I prepared a notebook in advance, actually far in advance, because of course this is pre-recorded. And we're going to open this in Jupyter Labs. Every one of our notebooks comes with a set of examples that are regularly updated with every new kind of launch and enhancements on the service. This makes it super easy to get started. But in here, we'll navigate to a script that should look super familiar, because it is exactly what I just showed you, which is our little bell state example. So again, no surprises. In this case, I'm going to choose one of our simulators as the target device. So as you can see here, I select our state vector simulator. It's called SV1. And we're going to define our circuit. Again, no surprises. It is our bell circuit from earlier, and also printed to the screen. And finally, we're going to execute it. So again, this is just going to be run as a task on our simulator device with 100 shots. In this case, we're going to print this, the results out to the screen. As you may have noticed, I didn't specify a specific S3 bucket where I wanted that stored, so it's just going to go into default location. Um, and we're going to just hit run on that and hopefully see the actual bell circuit. There it is. And you're going to start seeing the results coming in as well, and then they're going to get plotted here too. So as I mentioned earlier, you can use our service console to manage all of the resources that come out of your workflows, which includes tasks. So here, you can actually see the tasks that we just ran. Um, so it'll actually show this completed status, the device that it was run on. And in here is also where I can easily review my results later on to you. So here's where I can sort of link into the S3 bucket that was automatically generated for this task. And in there, you'll see the output results to insert this JSON uh, file format for later consumption whenever you need it to. So now that we've covered the basics of accessing and interacting with quantum hardware, let's think about how enablers might take that a step further. 
So enablers really need to take advantage of the quantum hardware that is available to them today. And as we all know, the devices that are available today are inherently noisy. In fact, many people in the community talk about this noisy intermediate scale quantum or NISC era that we're currently in. So as a result, most of the applications that we see enablers build for their customers are inherently hybrid, where quantum computers will use classical coprocessing. And by extension, that means enablers have asked us to find easy interfaces and ways to run those hybrid applications on bracket. And this is why we introduced something called hybrid jobs. With hybrid jobs, all you need to do to build a hybrid algorithm is select, define, and execute. Bracket will take care of spinning up any classical resources that are needed and orchestrating all of the infrastructure around that. With that, application developers can focus on what they do best, which is application development and not infrastructure management. And you'll actually see this in action in a second as well. So now that we've covered our pragmatists and our enablers, that sort of brings us all the way to the right-hand side of the spectrum that you saw earlier to our pioneers. So these are our academic researchers and corporate scientists. And these customers have asked us for lower level control over the quantum hardware itself. And the reason for that is that these customers are essentially looking to get the equivalent of bare metal access to the QPUs. They want to get as close as possible to the physical devices as if they're sitting in the lab themselves. They want to be this guy on the picture. And by the way, this was taken at our very own AWS Center for Quantum Computing. So again, if you'd like to learn more, please attend our session tomorrow. But these researchers and scientists are the ones who are looking to study and improve the performance of the quantum hardware that's available, understand the underlying noise, develop error mitigation techniques. And they need this level of access in order to do that because it's fundamentally otherwise not possible. And the closest equivalent to bare metal access today is something called pulse level control. Pulses are analog control signals that give you very fine grained control over the dynamics of a qubit system. Pulses are characterized by a time-dependent complex amplitude, a frequency, and a phase. So for instance, the amplitude primarily controls the rate at which a qubit rotates. So for example, you can see on the right-hand side how the pulse in black varies over time while the qubit state slowly flips from zero to one. And the amplitude is actually illustrated down below in this sort of Gaussian shape. And what is helpful to remember is the standard gates that we're used to interacting with are themselves implemented using sequences of pulses. So if you have pulse level access, that allows you to go beyond the gate level abstraction. It truly gives you the ultimate version of low level control in this world. Of course, that is exactly why Bracket does enable pulse level control. On Bracket today, you can get pulse level access to both the Rigetti Aspen M2 device as well as OQC's Lucy device, which means you can program quantum programs using pulses, using gates, or using both within the same circuit using one common interface. And that truly is the power of using Bracket as a platform to access quantum devices because customers don't need to spend time learning a new interface every time they want to target a different device or program at a different level of abstraction. Now, I'll cover a couple of basic concepts before I'll show an example and then actual demo. So a port is a software abstraction for the physical QPU ports. Think of them as like the IO components of a qubit. A frame acts as a clock in a quantum program that sort of gets incremented with each usage. And it also acts as a frame of reference for carrier signals, defining the phase offsets and the frequency and the time at which a certain waveform will get emitted. A waveform is a time-dependent envelope that allows us to emit a certain signal on an output port or receive signals from an input port. And we'll see all of that come together in an example exactly now. So as always, no surprises. We're going to select the device first because this is a bracket workflow. In this case, I used OQC's Lucy device, so you can see the Lucy ARN all the way at the top. And I used some predefined frames. So these frames are pre-calibrated to have their phase and their frequency to be on resonance with the corresponding qubit. So here I'm using the standard drive and a standard readout frame on Lucy for the zero qubit. I'm going to use a standard Gaussian waveform of a certain shape. And then in my pulse sequence, I'm going to set the phase to be pi over 2 play the actual Gaussian waveform onto the driving frame, synchronize the driving at the readout frame, and finally read out the state of the qubit. And I'm going to execute this as a task, as a standalone program, on my device using 100 shots. 
And if you're wondering what we did here, uh, we essentially implement the pulse level version of an RY gate, which rotates a qubit around the Y axis. And that is a neat example, but what I'm actually really excited about is an example here, which shows a use case for pulse level control that you actually cannot do at the gate level. And this is about gaining more control over individual qubit. And for that, it's helpful to know the resonance frequency of that qubit. In order to get a qubit's resonance frequency, you do something called qubit spectroscopy, which is an incredibly difficult word to pronounce with someone who's not a native English speaker, so I'll avoid that word. But what you do essentially is you define a range of frequencies and you play pulses to the qubit with those frequencies and measure the qubit. And that's exactly what we're going to do here. And neatly, it'll also show all the concepts we saw earlier. So here I'm using a job to execute this. And I'm gonna use actually the Rigetti device as our target device here, so you'll see the R in there. And we're supplying the algorithm we're going to run using the script here. So I'm just gonna kick off this job and you can sort of see how it says initializing. Of course, you can monitor the state of that job in our console, which you'll see in a second as well. So in here, it just says at the top there that it's cute and the device that it's targeting. And as we wait for that to execute, let's take a look at the script that we're actually going to run. So that is where sort of we define the actual um, algorithm that we're executing on the device. Again, no surprises, we select the device that I just supplied in the creation script. And we're again gonna use some of the predefined frames. So here, these are the standard frames available on the Rigetti device for the fourth qubit for the driving and the readout frame. We're again gonna define a standard Gaussian waveform. And then in our pulse sequence, that is sort of where the magic happens. So here, I'm gonna set the frequency based on an input parameter frequency that we're gonna supply later as part of our frequency scan. We're gonna play the waveform onto the driving frame and then read out the state of the qubit. And again, that is a perfectly valuable or valid uh, standalone program that you could just run by itself. And before we do that, we're gonna define that range of frequencies that I mentioned earlier that we're gonna play onto um, the qubit. And for each one of those frequencies, we're essentially gonna run exactly that pulse sequence we just defined by changing that individual parameter of the frequency with 100 shots each. And that's gonna be run as a task on the Rigetti device, and we're gonna get those measurements back and basically just calculate the probability of seeing zero uh, when we measure the qubit each individual time. Now, in the meantime, what's happening in the background is essentially our job is actually executing on the device as it's coming online. Uh, and we're gonna be able to see those results as soon as that is done, which you can monitor in the console. So you see the job status now went from queued to complete it. And with that, we can actually take a look at our results that we got back. And what you'll see is, obviously I ran this in advance, so you have the results ready here, and I sort of plotted the frequencies and the probabilities that we saw. And with that, it appears that the qubit's resonance frequency is 4.73 hertz. This is super exciting because it's just one of many examples how you can use pulse level control in a very um, interesting manner that doesn't, uh, isn't available to you at the gate level. And what I'd like to leave you with is sort of this notion of how we actually came up with bracket pulse. And this applies to pretty much anything that gets launched on bracket, which is working backwards from the customer. In fact, we worked very closely with a small group of customers that provided feedback to us that we iterated on before this became publicly available. And you can see some of the testimonials of these customers here. So if you or your customers have interesting use cases that you'd like to talk to us about, please find me, hunt me down in the hallway, or find us at our AWS booth. We'd love to talk about that. And with that, here are a couple more resources which you're very welcome to check out. And other than that, thank you very much for your attention. Okay, thanks Daniela. Uh, while we switch uh, to the next speaker, we do have time for maybe one question while we get set up. Any questions from the audience? Yes. Uh, does the pulse level control, like, how does one get access to that? Is that like, I, I'm a student, am I able to use that or is it like a paid for service type of thing? question. So the question was around how do you get access to bracket pulse. So pulse is just part of our SDK and in fact um, pulse was built on top of OpenCASM's grammar extension open pulse. So you can access or get pulse level control using our bracket SDK, using open pulse, using OpenCASM or the Python extension that we also open source as part of this called Occupy.